record onto this computer. Right, so, so, so those are the questions that we, we seek to answer in today's lecture. Uh, to lay a foundation, I'll be starting by answering the first two questions. And uh, Mr. Velimpele Usompi Sukodite will then take us forward in an attempt to answer the rest of the questions. As a way of opening, I'd like to quote Lumumba in a letter that he wrote to his wife. The quotation will also be a backdrop of my presentation as it speaks to Lumumba's dream for Congo and effectively for all of Africa. This is of course, in contrast to our enemy's aspirations. And this is what Lumumba said in a letter that he addressed to his wife and I quote, the only thing which we wanted for our country is the right to a worthy life to dignity without pretense, to independence without restrictions. This was never the desire of the Belgian colonialists and their Western allies. It goes without saying family that to this very day, our dignity and independence as African people is infringed upon by colonialists but our aspiration for a truly free, decolonized, independent and empowered Africa should not only be our aspiration, but it should be what we live for um, and, and actually prepared to die for. Um, I will begin with a slight background of Lumumba and move on to his schooling move on to his early uh, and of course later political contributions. Patrice Emery Lumumba was born on the 2nd of July in 1925 in uh, Onaula village near the Katako Kombe town in the Sankuru district of Northeastern Kasai, uh, Congo, uh, obviously today known as the Democratic Republic of Congo. He was one of four sons born to Francois uh, Tolenga and Gi Juliana Amatu. Lumumba belonged to a tribe called the Batetela. Uh, from an early age, Lumumba was very decisive and confident. He made his own decisions and fought his own battles. Lumumba was, was not a walkover. As an adolescent, he immediately stood out as a popular and strong character. His friends and family member, members remember him as a curious and audacious, uh, being very confident in his own abilities. As a young boy, Lumumba was also very loyal to his friends and he got involved every time there was a dispute among his friends. This element of his character gained him the nickname Nyumba Hachikala Lokonga, uh, one who always involves in himself. Uh, clearly Lumumba was unafraid of conflict and he always sought to effect reconciliation. A close uh, childhood friend, Andre Chupa, described a certain stubbornness about Lumumba. He said, and I quote, when he took a decision, he did not retreat from it. He had an enormous amount of self-confidence, never admitted defeat. It is said by another childhood friend that Lumumba had such self-confidence that when he was in fourth grade of primary, a colonial agent for the region visited the area of Anaula uh, to monitor the production of cotton and rubber. The agent immediately complained about the quality of cotton that came from the inhabitants of Naulua and intimidated by the white officials, by the white official, the villagers offered uh, chicken and eggs 
uh, you know, as, as a form of apology. But Lumumba got so furious by this and he confronted the agent. Uh, mind you, he was only in fourth grade. The colonial uh, agent said he wants to see the father of this audacious uh, schoolboy. Uh, moving on to his schooling, due to Congo being a colony of Belgium, uh, Lumumba attended both uh, Protestant and Catholic schools run by white Belgian missionaries as there were no state or public schools. All schools were run by missionaries. Lumumba's first period of school was between 1931 until 1933 with the Catholic mission. And in 1936 to 1937, he was moved to a Methodist school in Wembo Nyama. Lumumba was an intelligent student and he used to ask a lot of problematic questions. He often raised doubts about the type of education that was taught um, at school. He often frustrated his teachers who had trouble answering some of his questions. Lumumba liked to mix with the other older students uh, with whom he discussed ideas and read their coursework. Lumumba had a reputation as a prolific reader. He was known in Stanleyville as the Okanda Doka, which means a knowledge magician. This is a habit he became somewhat obsessed with as he grew older. Uh, family, it remains very important for us to read. Reading on its own is engaging in an emancip emancipatory program. Uh, in fact, this is a recurring habit uh, with great revolutionaries. In August 1941, at the end of two terms, Lumumba left school and did not return. The main reason was the breakdown of his relationship with his teacher. Uh, his friend Andre says this was caused by Lumumba correcting four mistakes in a phrase that the teacher had written on the board. The teacher was humiliated and had him thrown out of school. On his way back to Onaula, he told his friends that they are leaving the school because the teachers don't know their work. Lumumba then joined a school as a nursing assistant, but when his former teacher learned of this transfer, he sent a warning recommendation uh, uh, to Lumumba's school to exclude him from the school. So Lumumba was again without a school or a school uh, certificate. In 1942, Lumumba left for Stanleyville. Here he became a, civ a civil servant and immersed himself in the social and cultural life of the city. Lumumba stayed with Paul Kilimbulu, who was also known and respected by the Batatelas in the city. He introduced himself uh, as someone who came from Anaula and he was warmly welcomed by the family. Kilumbulu had five children at the arrival of Lumumba and says that Lumumba was like his sixth child. He quickly became integrated in the household. Lumumba, I mean, Kilumbulu says Lumumba was always curious and interested in whatever he was reading. Uh, Kilumbulu also says that he was respectful and amusing, and he often brought the family together with, with games and entertainment. From 1944, Lumumba intensified his efforts to improve his education since he left Onaula with primary school. On many instances, Lumumba would bury himself in books at a library and began his lifelong obsession with reading. By 1944, Lumumba started working as a clerk at a post office and in 1947, he obtained permission to pursue a course at the post office of Leopoldville. In 1954, Lumumba was notified that he had been recorded in the register of the civilized indigenous population known as an evolu. 
To achieve this status, each aspiring evolu had to jump through certain loops. You had to prove that you were evolved, suitably civilized. You'd be given a test. Someone would come to your house and see if you had an inside toilet, that your children wore pajamas, that you ate with a fork and knife. With this title came some privileges, uh, like you'd be allowed to enter certain whites only shops, which were normally bad uh, for Africans. In 1957, the governor, General Leo Petilion, asked Lumumba to form part of the Congolese delegation to Belgium in April and May later that year. Lumumba went to Belgium in 1956 for that study tour and at the age of 31, that's where he met you know, other political active Congolese. One of those that he met there was Mobutu Seseko, who was then about the, uh, the age of 26 years old. When Lumumba returned to the Congo, there was a personal disaster awaiting him. He was charged and convicted of embezzlement from the post office and sentenced to a year in prison. This is how then Lumumba relocated from Stanleyville to Leopoldville, where he also worked as a, at a brewery and became a sales manager of the brewery in about three years. While Lumumba was in Leopoldville, uh, modernly known as Kinshasa, he, while he was still in prison, he reconsidered his status uh, as an evolu and made a major shift towards Pan-Africanism and Congolese nationalism. The notion of nationalism enabled uh, Lumumba uh, to, to, to interact with different ethnic groups that made up the Congolese society to come together and fight against colonial economic exploitation, political repression, and cultural oppression. When Lumumba got out of prison, he was more active uh, in politics. When Belgium announced in 1959 that independence would come in 1960, people began organizing political parties. There was a party called the Movement National Congolese, the MNC, which had been formed in 1956, but had not but, not, but had not had much success. When Lumumba uh, moved to Leopoldville, he joined and galvanized it into action with his charismatic personality and public speaking skills, which won him many admirers, which made him the focal point of the movement. However, Lumumba's language of nationalism, of Pan-Africanism, was too radical for some in the party and they left to form a new party. Nevertheless, in the election in May, 1960, Lumumba's MNC gained a stunning majority in Stanleyville and a plurality in the national election. While the MNC did not by any means gain a national majority, its showing was indicative of a substantial support for a national identification and a rejection of ethnicity-based politics. After the election of 1960 uh, resulted in no party having received more than 25% of the popular vote, the Belgian authorities, as mentioned earlier, then tried to arrange a coalition between Patrice Lumumba and Joseph Kasavubu who formed a government. Lumumba's party, the MNC, had 33 seats in the parliament and Kasavabu, um, Kasavabu's political party, the Abako, uh, had 17 out of a total of 137 seats. The proposed coalition between the parties of Lumumba and Kasavabu, uh, for a number of reasons, did not work out. Probably the major impediment to such a coalition was the difficulty of Lumumba and Kasavubu in sharing power. 
Lumumba used his personal persuasion, uh, then, then went on to secure support of 23 small parties to form a government. Lumumba was named the prime minister of the country. The attempt to arrange a compromise between Lumumba and Kasavubu did not completely fail at that time because the MNC accepted the appointment of Joseph Kasavubu as president of the country. As the prime minister, uh, Lumumba faced sudden emergencies. The Congolese elite feared Lumumba's notion of nationalism and thus they started revolting against him. The revolt of the army and the breakaway of the provinces of Katanga and Southern Kasai were further emergencies. Lumumba sent Congolese troops to Southern Kasai province in attempt to restore the situation, but the poorly trained soldiers killed thousands of Congolese civilians. The United Nations blamed Lumumba for the massacre of civilians. Lumumba disliked Belgium and the UN for not helping to restore order and unity in Congo. It is also believed that some Congolese elite conspired with foreign states, especially the CIA and the US administration to get rid of Lumumba. When Lumumba asked for military help from the Soviet Union against the secessionist provinces uh, of Southern Kasai and Katanga, President Kasavubu dismissed him from office on the 5th of September, 1960. The Congolese National Assembly disagreed with the decision of the president and ordered Lumumba back in power as prime minister. This did not happen since a faction of the Congolese army under Colonel Mabutu Sisiseko took over the government instead and put Lumumba under the house arrest under the protection of Ghanaian troops of the UN force. Um, Lumumba managed to get out of the house arrest um, because he, he was put under house arrest by Umobutu Seseseko and attempted to leave for Stanleyville, but he was arrested by an army patrol and held prisoner in a military camp at Thaisville. From the military camp, Lumumba was transferred to Elizabethville, Katanga on January the 18th in 1961. And despite the presence of United Nations troops he was picked up by a small group led by Katanga's interior minister, uh, Godfrey uh, Munongo. And Lumumba was taken to a nearby house wherein he was assassinated. And family, I will be stopping here because I do know that um, Usom Pisi has a lot of information to share with us as well, but this was by a way of putting or laying a foundation uh, as he's going to take us further. Uh, some PC, I'll be handing over to you to take us further, Kodit. Uh, am I unmuted there? You are unmuted, some piece. Okay, no, thanks, Ndol. All right. Um... As usual, Kedlonda, thanks for the um, that very coherent. Uh, I just want to ask you, can, am I audible? Can everybody hear me? Let's start there. Yes, loud and clear, isolate. Yeah, you must respond. This is a conversation, so it's not between me and Londo. So don't feel afraid to talk to me. My Africa, you are not responding. That's my oh, word. No problem. No problem. All right. Lovely stuff. Lovely stuff. Yeah, this is Thank a you. conversation uh, amongst all of us as Africans. So we are simply just uh, leading the conversation. Uh, so you are not being lectured or being taught anything. We are having a conversation as Africans on our condition. 
as African people, and we are having the discussion on our terms. Right. With that said, um, I'll just say greetings. Uh, my name is Brother Nat. I'm um, based in the UK. Um, I guess that's a good and bad Hola. thing in the in the belly of the beast, where they cause all of the pain and destruction to our people, where it's where it got mastered. But it was just to say my apologies for my late arrival, and um, I'm so gutted I missed quite a bit of the what what had been said. But I'm here, nation builder, freedom fighter. Um, and I, my question really is, what was one hoping to achieve out of this uh, this coming together? Okay. No, but cool. rise up, everyone. All the kings right. in the show. No, thanks so much, my brother. Um, so, Nzianza, can I proceed? The floor is yours, some peace. Take all, all right. of it. Okay. <laughs> you are generous. Uh, no. Um, you, you gave a very coherent and um, very enlightening presentation on who Lumumba is, you know. And just before I go into my presentation, uh, it's always important to state that um, we take these things for granted, you know. Uh, this is probably, if not the only, it's amongst the only discussions that are happening currently on the African continent or in the black world in commemoration of this great um, warrior of our race, Lumumba, you know. So it is a very, very important uh, conversation, assembly or gathering that we, are happy, that we are having. And we will perhaps also later ask why it is that um, there is so, there is very little interest on the continent um, amongst the people that we call African leaders of various institutions in remembering Lumumba. Why is that the case? So before I go into um, the questions that I had prepared, there are basically just four questions and I will share them with you so that you are able to follow. Um, I just want to make some uh, context setting observations. Um, one of them is, um, as we remember Lumumba, the 60th anniversary of his assassination, uh, this month, the 20th, also marks the 48th anniversary of another great African warrior, uh, Amilcar uh, Cabral, who was assassinated in uh, 1973. Uh, we'll probably have a conversation uh, on the date on the 20th or so. As we remember Lumumba, we must also remember Amilcar Cabral, and I'll speak to other assassinations that happened later. Now, the other observation I want to make is um, assassinations, right, uh, especially in the 20th century, were a common method that was used uh, by the Europeans, in particular, the United States and France. Um, if I'm not mistaken, um, France is the leading assassin of African leaders in the 20th century. Uh, I doubt there is a country, a European country that has assassinated more African leaders than France. Um, uh, but that's just by way of illustration. Then you have also the United States, uh, because it's also implicated highly in the situation in the Congo and Lumumba's assassination. Um, the United States, to my knowledge, in the 20th century also, there is no state. Of course, the US is not a state, it's an empire. Uh, there is no state that has overthrown more legitimate governments than the United States, especially in the 20th century. And it was no surprise to that they were also involved through the CIA in the assassination of Lumumba. So the point that one is making is that uh, assassinations were a useful tool for the project of imperialism. It then meant, if you look at the Africans who have been assassinated, right? Uh, Amilcar Cabral, Didan Kimati, 
uh, Eduardo Monzane, Samora Marshall, Thomas Sankara, uh, Walter Rodney, Malcolm X, Fred Hampton, Bantubiko. If you look at all of them, right, uh, one of the things that they have in common, if you just uh, don't pay too much attention to the detail of how they were assassinated, is that these are all people who could be perceived of as being, having been a threat to European imperialism or white supremacy, you know, and this is how they were dealt with, they were assassinated. And we always make the point that it seems to us that um, those Africans who don't pose a threat to white supremacy or European imperialism usually don't get assassinated. You know, if they don't get co-opted, they get uh, elogized, uh, they get showered with praises and all sorts of things. And we have a number of examples of African leaders who are loved by uh, Europeans or the West. And, um, and you can make your own conclusion, you know, as to why they never had to be assassinated because they did not really pose the threat that these ones that I've mentioned posed. Uh, the secondly, um, so the other important thing is in in the case of Lumumba, um, Lumumba's assassination is also important to help us understand not just what is happening currently in the Democratic Republic of Congo, as it called, but in the whole of Africa, and I dare say. Um, the whole black world to understand our condition as black people globally, it is important that we understand the assassination of Lumumba, why Lumumba was assassinated and the whole situation in the uh, DRC as it were. Now, I did say that uh, I will just speak briefly to four questions as part of my contribution. And then the first question I will grapple with is, uh, what is the history of Belgian imperialism uh, in Africa. It's something that we don't often talk about. We speak about the French, we speak about the Germans, we speak about the Spanish, uh, we speak about the Portuguese, but we rarely speak about the Belgians and their role in Africa. The second question is, um, we look a bit at how and why Lumumba was assassinated. And I will focus more on the, the why. Why I think, what my thesis is, why I think Lumumba was assassinated. Uh, and then we will look at what are the, what characterizes the current situation in the DRC? You know, what are the things that are happening there uh, so as to give us a broad and deeper understanding? And then I will close with uh, probably the most important part because the brother from the UK sort of uh, nudged me in that direction when he was asking, what do we seek to achieve with this discussion? I will try and answer that question with um, point number four, which is the last point. Now, on the issue of um, the history of Belgian imperialism in Africa, it is important to understand that um, what you see happening currently in the DRC, right, is a culmination of over 130 years of Belgian imperialism over 130 years of Belgian imperialism. Uh, the situation in the DRC has to do with a number of factors. One of them is that uh, a repugnant gathering that was called in Berlin, right? Uh, between 1884 and 1885, uh, commonly referred to as the Berlin Conference, right? Um, that conference uh, took a decision to give uh, the Congo as the personal property to King Leopold II, right? And um, having been given the Congo as his personal property, King Leopold II committed uh, immeasurable and incalculable atrocities against our African kin there. He killed over 15 million of our kin there, uh, amassed uh, wealth, uh, which runs into the billions uh, in the in today's terms, and um, he used his army there that was called 
the force de public to enforce his reign of terror there. Uh, and one of the things that he did was that uh, the, they had to show him proof, you know, that they had carried out these instructions. And one of the ways in which that was done was to amputate the arms of uh, our African kin in the DRC. Many of you may have seen the pictures where many of them uh, have been amputated. Uh, that was presided over by King Leopold uh, of Belgium. Um, now, one of the things also is that um, the genocide that King Leopold committed, right? For some strange reason, uh, because you have a number of dishonest uh, people who call themselves scholars, even Africans who call themselves scholars, you know, and there's very little focus on the genocide that um, Leopold committed. And we are told about the many other genocides, you know, that pale in comparison, you know, when they are compared to the genocide that um, Leopold committed. And a lot of people, especially Africans, have very little knowledge of the genocide that was committed uh, by Leopold. And part of the reason is that uh, there is a general dishonesty, right, uh, uh, in, the, in the area of scholarship as it relates to European history, as it relates to what the Europeans essentially did in Africa. I think one of the most dishonest areas of scholarship is Europe's history in Africa. You know, and I dare say, uh, as Africans, it is extremely important that whatever Europeans say about their history on the continent, we must treat with utmost suspicion. Uh, there are also some African scholars that we should not trust, even when it comes on the subject, because the way our history is told is part of the problem of colonialism or coloniality, even today. Right. Now to make that point about Leopold is to help us understand how far back um, the problems that we have in the DRC today go, you know, that they go back to the Berlin conference. Uh, then in uh, 1908, Leopold then decides reluctantly to hand over the Congo to Belgium, which is again, an anomaly because in the first place, the Congo does not belong, did not belong to him. So how does he hand over the Congo to the Belgians uh, to whom it also doesn't belong, you know? And this just shows you the arrogance of Europeans, right? That an individual can think they can own uh, a piece of, of territory as big as the DRC and decide uh, what they do with this. This is the extent to which Europeans are arrogant, you know, that they can have us or our countries as their personal property. And like a football, they can decide what they do with our country, something that continues today. Uh, now, after the uh, handing over to, uh, to Belgium, right, uh, 1908, 1909, Leopold, um, then passes on or dies, you know, and then the Belgians uh, continue in classic colonial terms to preside over uh, the, uh, the, what we call the DRC today. Then as Nzonzo explained, um, something then happens uh, under the Belgians, right? He explained the part where the rise of people like Lumumba happens uh, under Belgian rule. And then um, the Belgians around 1960 uh, decide to call a, an election, um, which Lumumba and his um, organization were a bit skeptical of about, but eventually they decide to participate in this election. And when they participate, like Nlondo said, uh, Lumumba then gets elected and becomes the first legitimate leader of uh, the Congo, you know, and uh, he faces a number of challenges, the problems that um, Ndlondo alluded to, you know, one of them being um, um, 
the fact that he faces a rebellion, you know, which by all accounts was actually a concocted rebellion. And uh, as Ndlondlo said, around that period, 1960, 1961, um, he gets arrested and um, as prime minister gets placed under house arrest. And um, when he eventually is able to escape from house arrest, he gets rearrested, um, mainly uh, by the Mobutu troops. And as they arrest him, one of the things that they do is that they humiliate Lumumba publicly. Some of you may have seen uh, the brief videos or that picture where Lumumba is um, with um, Mpolo and Okibo, two of his ministers, they are at the back of a truck and um, he is um, tight. But one of the things that they do there is that they make him eat one of the speeches that he delivered, right, as part of the whole um, humiliation that they do. And this is done in front of his wife and his kid. You know, that humiliation, you may see the picture, but part of the story is that that is done in front of his wife and his kid. Now, he gets um, taken, like Ndlondlo said, to a remote province, a remote part rather of the Congo, right? Um, now, when he gets there, um, he and um, Polo and um, get uh, killed by firing squad and they get killed by firing squad. They then get buried in a shallow grave. Later, their bodies get exhumed. Uh, they get uh, chopped into pieces. After being chopped into pieces, they then get uh, disposed of through sulfuric acid, you know. Um, now, that whole plan, uh, while it may have been carried out mainly by Mobutu, you know, um, the planning, you know, involved the CIA and Belgian intelligence. And this is why both the Belgian government and the US through its State Department recently issued apologies for their involvement in the assassination of uh, Lumumba. So there is no um, guessing the CIA and Belgian intelligence were involved in the assassination of Lumumba. Right. Now, that happening, um, I did say um, it is also important to understand why it is it was uh, a decision was taken to eliminate Lumumba. Did it just have to do with uh, the situation in the Congo? Uh, we think there was more to the assassination and it had to do with a number of other factors, right? Um, now, one of the things is to also just help us um, build the context that we must understand is that um, just before, you know, uh, the rise and even the assassination of Lumumba, the US uh, passes a piece of legislation, and this is important because it helps us understand the bigger context. The Strategic and Critical Minerals Stockpiling Act of 1939. Now, in that piece of legislation, the US identifies strategic minerals for its strategic interest, right? And they make use of the word O, you know, OER, as one of these uh, class of minerals that are critical for them and their strategic interest, right? And um, one of the minerals that is classified as a ore, a metallic ore is coltan, the one that is in abundance in the DRC that is used for all sorts of electronic and aeronautics, um, this thing devices or products, right? Now, the US, this makes this decision of passing this piece of legislation. But here is what happens even before Lumumba is assassinated. The uranium that was used to develop the atomic bombs that were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima by the US before they killed uh, Lumumba was sourced from the DRC. 
the uranium, right? So that happens even before uh, Lumumba is assassinated. Then um, if you look at it, part of the other reason is that um, Lumumba, like Ndonzo has said, aligned himself on the continent with the Pan-Africanist forces, you know, uh, he, Lumumba became very emboldened after his meeting, especially with uh, Kwame Nkrumah, when he attended the 1958 meeting in Ghana, you know. Uh, that is also the meeting where the idea of African Liberation Day uh, was conceived. It was initially referred to as Africa Freedom Day and it was celebrated in April. It later, as you know, it changed to May, you know. Lumumba was part of that meeting and this is also where his Pan-Africanism, in my view, got sharpened. But then there's another decision that Lumumba also took. I'm just drinking water, which is like Ndlonjo said, uh, at the time he faced a rebellion, uh, after he could not get help from amongst others, the UN, Lumumba then decides to ask for help from the Russians and the Russians responded positively, you know, to his call. Now, this happens at the height of the so-called Cold War, and uh, it created a good excuse for the US and its allies, sorry, to um, then look at Lumumba as part of the Soviet camp and, you know, uh, give enough justification for his assassination, you know. Um, then there's another factor to also consider that um, the rise of Lumumba, you know, had not so much serious consequences for the economic interests of the US and Belgium and even France in the Congo. But what Lumumba was essentially challenging or what his um, uprising essentially um, uh, meant is that Rumumba's rise essentially challenged the very foundation of the Berlin Conference because the Berlin Conference had a lot to do with um, the DRC, you know, because it was called actually the Conference on West Africa at the time. And the DRC was the primary reason why this conference was called in Berlin uh, in the first place. Now, Lumumba, in my view, sought knowingly or unknowingly to undermine all that was agreed to uh, at the Berlin Conference. Remember an act was even passed at the Berlin Conference, which act laid down the framework for how Africa should be divided um, amongst the various uh, European uh, thieves, you know, as we would have it today. So in my view, Lumumba uh, posed a much bigger threat not just for the imperialist interest in the Congo, but for the imperialist, imperialist interest in Africa as a whole. Uh, the current situation, if you come to the current situation in the DRC, having given that context of uh, the history of Belgian imperialism, uh, the role of the US and others, and uh, what the assassination of Lumumba meant, uh, we now see the, re the, the situation in the DRC. The DRC has never been stable. If you look at that 135, 136 history, the DRC has never been stable. It continues to be characterized by coups, by assassinations, by armed conflict, uh, by brutal acts of violence against civilians. And in particular, one of the phenomenons, which is the mass rape of uh, women, uh, our sisters and our mothers in the DRC, which is carried out by armed groups, many of them sponsored and uh, by amongst others neighboring states like Rwanda and Uganda, you know, something that is not openly spoken about, right? Um, now, and this has been, if you look at, in addition to the say plus minus 15 million that were killed and uh, Leopold, you know, from say 1996 to the current situation in the DRC, you've had in addition to the 15 million that were killed of Africans under Mobutu, you've had over 6 million, right? Um, 
who continue to be killed or who have been killed rather in the DRC, you know. And strangely, there's a genocide that happened during the time of uh, Leopold, like I said. There's a genocide that happened uh, in the period, say, 1996 to the 2000, you know. Again, why is there no um, uproar on the African continent and in the multilateral bodies about the continuing genocide in the DRC? We are being told about the other genocides, if they are genocides, right, in the other parts of the world. And that is where the focus is. Why is the genocide against our kin in the DRC not something that makes the world come to a, a standstill, right? When the West continues to extract uh, minerals and all sorts of benefits from the DRC, why is that not the case? Um, further to that, a uh, two, 2003 UN report, there's also a report by Amnesty International, you know, implicated not just the DRC, but it also implicated Kenya, Angola, Burundi, the Central African Republic, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe in either the distribution, exploitation of the mineral resources of the Congo or fueling the armed conflict. That it is not just the uh, Uganda and uh, the DRC, but other African countries are also implicated in this uh, report. Then there are, of course, many of the Western companies, especially the ones that are in the um, uh, information and uh, communications technology sector, right? Because they are the biggest beneficiaries of the culture uh, that gets uh, taken out of the DRC through, amongst others, the uh, uh, Uganda and uh, Rwanda. Um, which brings us to the last point I want to make. Um, what are the tasks of the African Liberation Project post Lumumba, right? Uh, and we, we, we make this point because it is our understanding that Lumumba was just not a statesman or a um, native of the Congo. Lumumba was an integral part of the African Liberation Project, as it were. And this is why his assassination is referred to by some historians as the most important, if you like, uh, uh, assassination of the 20th century. Now, what are the tasks for the African Liberation Project uh, post Lumumba, in my view? Um, uh, a couple of things I think uh, should constitute the tasks. One of them is that uh, I think um, we need a new wave of decolonization on the continent, right? And I want to qualify it and say Afrocentric decolonization. Uh, and by that, I mean a decolonization project that bases itself on the experiences of African people and their epistemologies as central to their understanding of coloniality and decolonization, right? And uh, what, what should constitute the elements of this new wave of decolonization that I'm calling for? One of them is that um, as, as people who have an interest in this, one of the things we must look at, it is happening is that we must consciously build networks of revolutionary movements on the continent, stitch these networks together, right? Uh, because as things stand, uh, our challenges that we have in the individual African states, right, are not things that necessarily have their genesis in those African states, but they have to do with the colonial history that I've just painted. So it is important in my view to have a pan-African organization or movement that looks at um, the new wave of decolonization that I'm proposing. So some of the campaigns that such a movement 
if it is built, uh, should look at is um, to have campaigns that expose and oppose the continued capture of Africans, Africa's resources, uh, both by the native uh, bourgeoisie, but also by foreign multinationals with the connivance of the native bourgeoisie, right? Uh, an example of this, if you use the South African context of a connivance between the native bourgeoisie and foreign multinationals, have what happened, for instance, in South Africa with the Marikana uprising, right, is a classical case of that. There is another case of the Amadiba Crisis Committee uh, in what is called the Eastern Cape in South Africa. It is a manifestation of that battle of the capture of our natural resources, which is something that continues. The other thing, um, such a movement will also have to look at exposing, right, both African and foreign countries that are involved in fueling armed conflict on the continent. Um, I've mentioned the role of countries like Rwanda and uh, Uganda, you know, in fueling armed conflict. They are not the only ones. Um, now, related to the issue of armed conflict uh, on the African continent, we must also ask questions about other disturbing things that we are seeing happening on the continent. Right, the continuing presence of the French on the African continent. Um, the French have about 11 military bases in Africa and just over 8,000 um, troops, you know, boots on the ground as it were in Africa. Uh, the majority of them, about 5,000 or so, are in the region that is called uh, the Sahel, which is part of uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, Mauritania, and uh, more, yeah, and uh, chat. Now, one of the reasons why France, in my view, uh, continues to have such an interest and a military presence in the African continent has to do also with their mineral interests, um, especially in um, Niger, uh, where a French company, it used to be called Arriva, I think they've changed their name. Um, the Niger is the fourth globally is the fourth biggest producer of uranium. And the French have made heavy uh, investments uh, in that part of the world. And I often say to people when the French um, release their army, it is not for peacekeeping or to look after the property or the lives of Africa. It is to protect their economic interest, especially in what is called the Sahel. Then you have, in addition to the French, you have um, the US is said to have 29 military bases, right? In about 15 African countries. I'm sure you know about something called uh, AFRICOM or the Africa Command of the US, right? Now, just like the French, we must ask questions as Africans, what? interest does the US have in setting up military bases uh, on our continent, right? Um, then this movement that's gonna push for what I call a new wave of decolonization must also fight and expose the theft of Africa's uh, financial or capital resources. What is called um, illicit um, financial or capital outflows. Um, a recent, that is 2020, uh, UN report, right, uh, said um, the amount of money or capital that leaves the African continent annually, you know, amounts to something like $50 billion per annum. Illicit capital or financial outflows, you know, and that money is going to the very people who invaded, exploited, murdered and raped Africans. Our money continues to build those countries, just like it happened during the era of slavery when the slave economy was responsible for building Europe. And they continue to tell the lie that it was the industrial revolutions of Europe that built uh, Europe. We know it was the slave economy. Like I said, one of the most dishonest things is European history. 
and we must dismiss their scholars every time they want to lecture us on that part. Then the last issue that such a movement must look at is the return of the thousands of stolen uh, African artifacts that are stored in the various universities, museums, and libraries in Europe. Just to give you an idea, uh, it is said, for instance, in Belgium, there are about 180,000 of our artifacts just in Belgium. In Germany, about 75,000. In France, about 70,000. In Britain, about 69,000. And even in Austria, uh, about 39,000. Um, those um, fellow Africans and warriors are, in my view, some of the things that uh, a new wave of decolonization or a revolutionary movement will have to look at as part of his revolutionary program to advance the work of liberating our continent that was um, done by people like Patrice Lumumba. It is really just by way of a minimum program. Thank you so much for your audience, peace and black power. Sibong is on peace. Sibong is a cool kodi tendo tamatota. Amazing presentation, very informative. Sibong is a cool for always um, going an extra mile to ensure that we are we are educated. I I call us on peace a walking library. I call him a a school because we we continue to learn from you and still on a pilaman is on peace. Uh, I think as a way of um, being conversational, like you said, some piece at the beginning, uh, let's also open the floor to others. Um, people are, are very informed and uh, they can eloquently uh, speak uh, for, for, for a long time. But um, you know, just as a way of commenting, uh, making an input, maybe asking a question for clarity as well, in, in no more, no more than two minutes, <laughs> um, we will allow people to freely unmute their mics and, and, and just say something like we said, this is a conversation family. So Sesi Lahelagini Gemanje to also say something uh, and then we will be ready to close. Well, I think there's always that awkward silence, isn't there, before anyone decides to speak up. <laughs> But I just wanted to say give thanks for the thorough presentation. Again, I know I've spoken before, so I'll keep it short. I just wanted to know from um, Brother uh, Sompisi, what would you say um, our honorable ancestor Patrice Lumumba could have done differently, or, or anyone really could have done differently that could maybe help us today to not make the same mistakes because as we know history often gets repeated in sometimes different forms um, but yeah that's my question really plain and simple what could he possibly have done differently or did not think of that we can even think of will be um, helpful for for today um, I'll just land with just that um, I'm part of a few organizations, but one mainly you may have heard of um, the Rapid Africa Plan, um, headed by Pro Professor Hannington. Um, you know, over here in the UK, we're quite aware of those that are trying to do the works on the continent. Um, I'll send some details, I'll sure. keep it short, but I'm just honored to be amongst so many brothers and sisters across the, the whole of the continent. It is beautiful to that we can take advantage of this technology right here. Um, yeah. But yeah, rise up everyone, respect. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Nat, for that. You know, I just remembered something that um, Petrus Lumumba once said, and he said, African unity and solidarity are no longer dreams. They must be expressed in decisions. And um, this is true, I think. We, we, we can no longer just speak as an aspiration about solidarity of the Black family. It must be seen in the decisions that we make it must be seen in, in our daily lives and the kind of decisions that we make in our lives. Um, is there anyone else who would like to say something? There is that awkward silence again. Who will break it for us? Hi. Um, thank you very much for the presentation and very informative. My question is that we talk about the movement and how the movement should address these issues that we all know and what we have learned today. However, Africa is where it is today because there are other agendas out there that are trying to put us down. So how do we deal with that? Because these agendas include some of our African brothers and sisters. They are part of this agenda that see us to, like it's like it's meant for us to be where we are today. So the question is how, if we have this movement going and addressing all those issues, how do we deal with these other issues that will come from within our own brothers in Africa? Thank you. Noted, noted Queen Warrior. Oh, so I don't know if you want to attempt um, answering those questions before we open the floor to others. Okay. All right. Um, all right, my brother, brother Nate. Um, thanks, thanks for that. Um, very difficult question. You know, a very difficult question. And um, as somebody who you know, um, has a keen interest in Africa's resistance history, not just on the continent, right? Because it's a global history. Um, it's a global history. So when I say African, I don't mean African in the geographic sense, you know, I, I mean African in the global sense. That's how I look at it. Um, so I also then notice that um, some of the things that, um, I mean, the same question can be asked about Thomas Sankara, you know, the same question can be asked about uh, Kwame Nkrumah, you know, the same question can be asked about Samora Michelle, the same question can even be asked about Malcolm X, you know, um, and when you look at, and this is the benefit of hindsight, uh, white supremacy, capitalism, imperialism, right, presents itself as a global force. And often the reason why we end up with our leaders being killed and assassinated is that um, the response that uh, we give to white supremacy, capitalism or European imperialism is not globalized. You know, uh, it's not globalized because if you look at it uh, in, in the way that they deal with uh, our leaders, you know, there's always an alliance amongst uh, the white world to deal with one leader. There's always an alliance, you know, and they sometimes use our own people uh, as fronts for this alliance, you know. So, I mean, if you look at it, Malcolm X, for instance, if you look at all of them, there is not a single African leader of these ones that I have mentioned who was assassinated by one country. You know, there were various levels of uh, cooperation, some of which we will never know about, you know, because any leader that speaks or represents African unity or black power is looked at as a threat to, the, to white power globally. You know, 
And so the white world makes their resources available to deal with a Lumumba, to deal with a Malcolm X, to deal with a Fred Hampton, to deal with a uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, to deal with a um, Walter Rodney, you know? So anybody who has that force, because they understand that white power presents itself as a global force. So I think that is one of the things that many of our leaders learned either very late or, they, and, or we have not learned that, that there's no fight for African liberation on the continent, in the Caribbean, in the US or in the UK or in Latin America. It is a global fight. It's a global fight. And unless we organize ourselves, and I will dare say, I don't like to give a lot of detail. Um, white power is sustained through the force of violence. You know, it's not sustained only through lectures and through nice academic papers. No, white power is sustained through the force of violence. And it's one of the lessons that we must learn if we are going to avoid the mistakes that uh, our great elder Patrice Lumumba and others may have made, you know, uh, that uh, the force that we are up against, we are not going to be able to effectively confront that force through webinars, you know, amongst others, uh, through other forms. And it is a discussion we can have. I'm sure you catch my drift that the detail of that discussion is something that we can have once we have a space where we can work out the detail of the plan, you know, on how to respond to it. So, but the long and short of it is that I just think we must understand the true nature of the force that we are up against, you know, and I think not all of our leaders had a deep appreciation, right? And this is why, for instance, you know, uh, Lumumba, for instance, went to the Belgians when he was under threat, he went to the same Belgians, you know, to ask them, and that shows you that uh, those are the kinds of mistakes, you know, that we should avoid making, you know. So that's really the long and short of a very, to a very complex answer or question rather, you know, my brother. Um, to the question that was asked by the warrior queen, uh, it has a similar dimension as well, you know, in that, and I did make the point in the, input that um, to get to Lumumba, right, they had to co-opt um, a couple of Africans, you know, um, Chombe was one of them. It was not just, um, it was not just, Lum it was not just Mubuto, Chombe was one of them. To get to Cabral, they had to have Emmanuel Kani. To get to um, Sankara, they had to have a blaze Kambaure, you know. So our sister is absolutely correct that the people that we are fighting have people amongst us who are willing to do their dirty work, you know. And um, the question perhaps for us is in how we plan going forward, right? When we do risk analysis um, or yeah, our risk assessment, right? We must decide how we deal with the internal risks. You know, and I will be blunt. How do we deal with the traitors of our race? You see, because they are nothing else but traitors of our race. You see, uh, Lumumba was killed like a dog because the traitors like Mobutu and Chombe decided to sell their souls to the Europeans. And we must understand that that is the reality of our situation that we have traitors within our race and we must take a decision how we deal with the traitors within our race. And I would, I would again suggest that it is the type of conversation that if we get down to the nitty gritty of building the movement, we will have that discussion in a safer space, you know, uh, as opposed to in a space like this one. And I'm sure my sister would understand why I would not even want to elaborate on how I think we can deal with it. But I'm sure uh, we have a couple of ideas because uh, our history shows us. Uh, 
that was beautifully answered, I think. I hope um, Brother Nat and Sister Kimelo are also answered in that regard. Um, is there anyone else as a way of closing? I think we, we need to release uh, our family now. We don't want to hold you hostage for too long. Um, just as a way of closure, I'll open maybe to one or two people to make um, a comment and then we can... Can I come in? Yes, yes, uh, Keda Zulu. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And thanks to <clears throat> Usom PC for, for the input that he's made. I, I have this take, Yoguti, um, all our leaders, the African leaders who've been killed, I think when we come together and commemorate them, I think the point of focus or point of departure is always their brutal death, right? But if you look at most of them, uh, quite, a, quite a lot of them have basically uh, left some written documents that map out their vision of what needs to be done. It might not be complete by virtue of their lives being cut short in some respects. You, it's Biko, Kwame Nkrumah, even with Lumumba, you might have to go to the archives and just try and bring together his coherent vision that he articulated himself, not what he stands for or he represents as a symbol. So I really think that uh, there's nothing wrong with looking at that to remind ourselves. But I also would like to see in future going forward, a situation where we really zoom in directly into what these people wanted to do. Because when we start from that, then what some PC was trying to do now with these points about how we should go forward as a movement, it starts, it connects from those points that Kwame Nkrumah, Cabral, everybody else have articulated. Then there's a link, then there's continuity. It doesn't have to look as if all the time we're starting from scratch because we're always perpetuating what was started from, 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 from the beginning. And then lastly, I think when you talk about Lumumba, yes, the death part is very important, but during the death, during the time when he was captured, there is a very important aspect of Lumumba that nobody talks about, which is the letter that he wrote. Probably that's the last piece of work that Lumumba wrote from his own pen. I would advise that everybody should look at it. I can't quote it now because uh, I'm not a person of good memory and I'm not looking at it. But I remember distinctly that there is not if I were in that situation, I would hardly remember my vocabulary of what to write in that situation. We are captured, we are certain that you're going to be killed and that you write the most lucid, the most coherent, the most vigorous letter that I've ever heard ex exhorting Africans to look towards the future because ultimately his own conviction was that Africa would stand. There would come a time when Africa, regardless of these traitors around him, where Africa would stand up and, and, and hold its ground amongst the nations. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for being long, but thanks for, the, for allowing me to make the input. Data Zulu, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I fully, I think we fully uh, concur with the suggestion that you have made and it is duly noted uh, for, for that input, much, much appreciated. Um, there was someone's hand that was up, Kwame Gonza, I hope I'm saying it correctly. And then I see Edward Seke, your hand is also up. I will um, give you guys an opportunity. Yes, that's correct. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kwame Gonza. Um, uh, I work with the Rapid Africa Plan uh, as one of the leadership of the movement. Um, I'm also on the board of uh, uh, the Africa 55 States, which is based in South Africa, and also the Kwame Nkrumah Geological Institute in, uh, in Ghana. I'm uh, 
the director of uh, uh, media and public relations. Now, I think as the youth, we have to be very clear on what we want. Uh, the vision uh, for Africa was set already, it is to unify Africa. I think that vision just needs to be redefined with a sense of urgency. And we have to be very, very clear on the vision. One of the things, uh, the organization which uh, I, I just met recently, which is called the Rapid Africa Plan, has defined, uh, redefined the vision of what we should be doing right now is that we should be looking at developing Africa in the next 40 years. Because if we are the youth, then in 40 years, we are going to be there to a leading GDP of 60 trillion. Now, the AU is saying that Africa will be 30 trillion by, by 40 years. But the Rapid Africa Plan is saying that we can build Africa to a leading GDP of 60 trillion. China will be 50 trillion. So this, I think this is a very clear vision for the youth to look at in rebuilding Africa. So we have to rally behind something as this and be very, very clear about it. And then we mobilize in each country, in each country, South Africa, Ghana, Uganda, Kenya, we all have to be saying one thing. If we do not say one thing, one person is saying this, another one is saying this, another one is running in different direction, we have to run in one direction. The direction it has to be very clear. These people, they do not understand anything. So other people running with Bobby Wine, others running with Julius Malema, others are running with this one. This is not going to work. So we have to be very, very clear. So if we say we, are, we want to reconstruct Africa very quickly on African thought, not Chinese thought, not European thought, on purely African thought. So I think we need to agree on this and then start moving forward and rally behind the programs like the Rapid Africa Plan. Okay, so we mobilize in each country a group of people and then we agree on activities which are going to be done. So this is uh, my contribution. This is my thought, which I think that going forward we, we, should, we should be doing. So the Rapid Africa Plan right now is bringing together these organizations. Uh, uh, is, is a project. It is a project. And uh, the Kwame Nkrumah Ideological Institute is an organization which was started by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah himself. But when he came, it was, uh, when, when, when he was overthrown, it was destroyed, but it has been revived. Just to remind you, that is where even uh, uh, Comrade Robert Mugabe, the, the, the recent president, the former president of uh, Zimbabwe, he was, you know, ideologically mm -hmm. educated. There. So it has been revived, and under the Kwame Nkrumah Ideological Institute is is where these organizations, which are Pan African in nature, and all those people who wish Africa well, are coming together to work on the Rapid Africa Plan. So. But mostly, this vision, the person who designed it, who is actually from Zimbabwe and has been staying in the United States for the last 20 years, designed it for the youth to drive it. And that is what we are doing. So we have to be very, very clear in thought and in action. Thank you very much. Brother Kwame Bonza, thank you so much for that input. I think your sentiment coincides uh, with that of Keda Zulu, who speaks of uh, black solidarity as well as being future oriented. And, and, and I think this also speaks to what some PC uh, spoke about, that uh, we need to understand that this is a global um, fight that we are up against. And I think you are also speaking to that, that we need to be, you know, uh, organizing ourselves, mobilizing ourselves from a global, point of view and not in our small corners there and there, because absolutely, I agree with you that our greatest ammunition against uh, the enemy that we are fighting, which is highly uh, organized and has a lot of precision, we have to be united. We have to, to, to speak from one voice. Uh, so thank you so much for that input, uh, Brother Kwame Gonza. We highly appreciate it. And I think we must then some PC forge ways of, of, of talking with um, about Brother Ned and about Brother Kwame Gonza and, and seeing how we can organize ourselves, especially with the plans 
that we have underway of uh, you know the, the the movement that we want to launch soon. So we will continue to forge ways and find ways that we can mobilize ourselves, organize ourselves importantly so that we can continue the great fight uh, with, with, with order and with uh, organization. Uh, Brother Edward, followed by Brother Sbusi, so I would like to give you an opportunity as well. I saw your hands were raised. Edward, um, Edward Seke, Sbusiso, Ntsele. Uh, I think Edward has to unmute. You can speak so long, Mr. Ntsele. Uh, okay. Uh, mine is a short one. Um, it's directed to the host and some PC. What's your assessment with regards to African Union's attitude on the matters uh, relating particularly to the Democratic Republic of, of Congo? Thank you. So, my name is Lashela Guwezong. Do you want us to take this one or wait for the other one? Let's let's get another one. Okay, sure. Uh, Brother Edward, are you are you winning with unmuting yourself? I presume not. Okay. Oh, Can okay. I come in? Yes, you may come in. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I want to say a very big thank you and then uh, congratulate you guys for initiating such another beautiful move for us to unite. Um, I think greed is number one thing that we have to erase from Africa. And then because what, we, what I can see now is that our leaders are not showing any concern I am speaking from Ghana, Volta region. Our leaders are not leading us to the, 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 the true destination of Africa. So we have to take it upon ourselves. Let us advise other people who are initiating moves. Divided we fall, united we stand. So let me use this opportunity to extend a profound gratitude to our late former leaders, Steve Biko, Nkrumah, Thomas Sankara, and the rest. They have fought a good fight, and we have to pick it from here. I am glad I joined this conversation, and I will continue to be around. I'll be, I'll be available anytime, any, anywhere you, you need me, because we want to change. But I want to ask the panel, are you, are we, are you aware, we are hearing, that the vaccines that they are spreading or they are sending to Africa mm -hmm. is not a real one we should embrace. So I want to ask the panel if it is true that the vaccines that they are sending to us only in the name of fighting coronavirus, should we accept it? Because I'm coming to, I'm, I'm going on an errand to educate people. I want to know, that, I want to hear the facts. Mm. Yeah. Uh, my brother, Thank you so much. Uh, I do think uh, that one will, will stretch very long on its own. It's a, it's a conversation on its own that might take a very, very long time. Uh, but you know, I, I'm actually busy typing something now to everyone to say, as we cannot exhaust everything here, I think we, we must find ways of uh, continuing to have such discussions yeah, on international and, yeah. and I'm, I'm, I'm dropping my, my WhatsApp number and this way I'll be able to, to connect. Uh, we have a few groups running, um, Black Brothers uh, United, some PC, we have the Blacks Only in Bezo. We have, we have quite a few groups that we can add people on for further 
uh, deliberations and for further conversations. I'm afraid that we, we won't obviously be able to exhaust everything here. But uh, Brother Edward, I must thank you. You made a commitment. You said you'll always be with us. You'll always join anytime. I must thank you for your commitment and I must thank you uh, for being part of this conversation with us. We, we truly do not take it for granted, Black family. Um, and, and also we are in no way claiming uh, all knowledge. We, we are not the monopoly of wisdom and the monopoly of, of, of knowledge. So by way of making these presentations, we are not in any way claiming that we have all the solutions mm -hmm. and that we have, you know, we know everything. So we, we highly appreciate uh, the opportunity of connecting with brothers from different parts of the world uh, joined together by one agenda, which is furthering the interests of black people. So like I said, I'll be dropping uh, my WhatsApp number and then those who, who, who want to reach out to us, please do so, so that we can, we can continue with, with these deliberations and conversations. Uh, some people say, let us take Utulam Sindo and then you will just um, close up for us. And then okay. I'm going to ask family that we wrap it up there and then we'll, we'll have further conversations moving forward. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Am I audible? Yes, yes. absolutely. Okay, thanks. First and foremost, let me thank you for inviting me. And I would like to greet all of you with a feast high on the air saying African unity and solidarity is key for us all. And I'm saying this with a bleeding heart because I've just learned that indeed, the war is just too big, it's a global fight. It, it is a fight with the white supremacy, a fight with people who have got enough power and we remain very poor. But for sure our ancestors will assist us to take this battle forward. And that will only happen if we are true and authentic to ourselves as Africans. I'm a bit disturbed of all that you have said from point A up until the last end. It is very clear that we know what we want as Africa. We, we are not confused. However, we've got traitors amongst ourselves. Yes. And the reason we are not moving forward is because of these traitors. And maybe the question should be, why is it that our own brothers and sisters are selling their souls instead of us achieving a simple goal of saying, this is our country, this is our land, this is us. But here we've got people who are able just to receive something to sell the entire nation. And the, la the previous speaker has touched on the question of vaccination. It is so sad that it is so sad and unfortunate that we don't have much time because I think that is very key for us to locate what is happening in Africa in totality in relation to this vaccination. And maybe in closure, I will say, I agree with all the inputs that were made. We, we, we need to stand up. We need to read and understand these things from the context of what is actually happening and what happened and where do we want to see ourselves. But Oksalayo, we've got people who are so adamant to go along one of the books that I have read which speaks of the friends of the natives. And it is this friends of the natives that have got an upper hand on us and they are a stumbling block. They are frustrating us in terms of ensuring that there is a, a real change. We don't want cosmetic changes here. We want 
fundamental transformation so that we move forward more so that this is our country it is not anyone's country we can't be beggars in our own country and i would like to thank you and thank you again let's continue with this conversation because they give us a clear picture of where we are what is frustrating us and moving forward thank you very much Gloria Queen, thank you so, so much um, for that. And I, I must um, mention that I think the conversation around vaccines and the whole unfolding and development of, of COVID-19 is a pertinent conversation to have. I, I think it's very, very important. And I'm just having a thought now that uh, we can have or we can schedule a separate conversation as soon as possible. And I see someone has posted um, or has, has said something here, Utula Sizwe is saying, Mina, I'm asking for the panel to invite a panel of scientists to clarify on vaccine. It's very painful that we have scientists but only keeping the information to themselves. I think um, some PC, this is something we can discuss. Uh, perhaps we can schedule a discussion um, we can strategize around it and see how we can go about it. But I do think it's, it's important for us to, to, to have this conversation. I've also been asked many times uh, on this and um, on, on, on many occasions, I get torn on, on what exactly to say, uh, but I think it's important that we all uh, come together and, and really map you know, a way forward as, as well as having a clear understanding of the plan, obviously, um, of depopulation, but also to raise the necessary awareness and consciousness with our people so that there is a clear understanding on, on what is going on. Uh, some PC, I'm going to ask you in attempts of answering, I forgot who asked the question, uh, but the last question that was asked and also as a way of, of closing today's presentation for us. And I've yeah. already dropped um, I've already dropped my numbers as well as some pieces number here for anyone who's who's willing to reach out to us so that we can um, continue organizing ourselves and see how we can frame um, conversations moving forward. Some piece. Yes, um, and so, yeah, no, and uh, like you correctly said, right? Um, so it's important for the family to understand here that uh, we are strong and unapologetic advocates of African unity and principled African unity, and um, we don't want feel good unity, you know, and uh, unity for unity's sake. We want unity that is based on a concrete understanding of our reality as Africans globally, but most importantly, unity that is driven by a sincere commitment to change that reality, that we as Africans should have a reality where we are masters of our own destiny in the true sense of our word, of the word. We educate our own children, we produce our own food, we run our own countries. Um, we produce our own vaccines, right? And other forms of medication that we develop a, to a state where we don't have to outsource all of those things to other people, right? Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, other, other countries and other race groups produce their own solutions, their own instruments. There's nothing wrong with us as Africans also doing that in fact it's the most intelligent thing for us to do you know uh, and, and that is the platform that we stand on the other thing is um like uba Bunzondo has said right this is really a platform for us to exchange ideas um we don't come with the mindset that says we have all the solutions or we have all the knowledge there's no such thing anyway as a know-all so um, it's more for us to create a platform for us to come together and have a meeting of mind. And we're also interested in Africans who are serious about Africa, right? Not people who just posture and they shout nice slogans about African, African unity, but they are not serious about it. And this is why 
uh, in the work that we do, we don't have any tolerance for pretenders or people who uh, are interested in, uh, you know, joining the long line of traitors of Africa. You know, we are not interested in that. So we are going to, like Kundlondwe said, uh, connecting with you, um, all of you who have expressed an interest. We are South African based, and uh, but we have an agenda to build a movement on the continent and globally. So we will be reaching out with you in that context. We will also look at, like Kundlondwe said, that the discussion on vaccines, right, is a deep and involved discussion. And one of the things that goes with the discussion is the whole thing of chemical and biological warfare, right? That has been waged historically on African people. So vaccines are just a small part of that discussion. Uh, for me, the broader discussion relates to us understanding chemical and biological warfare and things like bioterrorism and how those things work. Uh, and so I, I agree with the view that says uh, we must have very soon a discussion where we get a panel of Pan-Africanists and pro-Black scientists, right? Because some of our scientists are very Eurocentric and problematic, you know? And the other reality is also that many of our Black professional scientists included are terrorized, are some of the most terrorized people in the world because they work for white or European institutions. So many of them get terrorized and harassed. So we must understand that this is not just epistemic or cognitive. Uh, this is part of the war that is being waged against our race. That's why you see many of our scientists uh, shuffling up, so to speak. You know, uh, they speak. They don't even speak in WhatsApp groups because uh, white supremacy does not play with those who challenge it or who challenge their racist science. So let's have a broader discussion. I agree with um, um, Africans who are more knowledgeable uh, on the subject, whether it's virology, epidemiology, immunology, you know, and other related subjects uh, in the natural sciences. Then um, we'll perhaps also have to have a discussion also on the African Union as well. I don't want us to leave that question because it's highly involved is to, and ask questions about how the African Union came into being and what is its agenda? Because remember, the African Union is presented as a successor to the Organization of African Unity, right? And uh, what was the agenda of the Organization of African Unity? And it is, and is it an agenda that resonates with us? And what is the agenda of the African Union? You know, and those are the deeper discussions that I think we are going to be having at one of the sessions. Um, or at, um, as we interact with people offline, like you have said, but it is an important discussion. I will only say though, there are no other African leaders, right? The African leaders we are looking for and we are talking about are the people who are gathered on this platform. Mm -hmm. There are no other African leaders. So we must stop the mindset of outsourcing our responsibility to lead and liberate our race to other people. That is the first thing we must overcome, the inferiority complex to look to people who are in elected positions. The leadership of our race is an important thing and it can't be uh, left to people who are elected. People who are elected are bought and they are paid for. And it is important that we make that realization that the leaders, the liberators of Africa must come from amongst us. It should be us. I want to leave it uh, on that note. Let's continue working uh, offline. Amak. Black power, black power, black power. Uh, black family, thank you, thank you, thank you once again. Sibonga Kulu. Thank you so much. We will continue keeping in touch. I see a lot of people are suggesting um, quite a number of things and a number of people that we should consider for our conversations. Like I said, I've dropped my number as well as some pieces WhatsApp number. Let's, let's continue offline. Let's continue deliberating offline. 
and you will hear from us shortly. Do follow us uh, on, on Facebook. Um, on Facebook, some PC Gonje, you are some PC. I'm trying to remember your name on Facebook. Kotete. Yes. Um, it's some PC Kotite Mpemba. Yeah. Thank you very much. You can also follow us on Arise Black Child. And like I said, we have also given WhatsApp details. So let's continue talking offline. Thank you very much. We will stop here for our conversation today until we meet again. Thank you. Those who are skilled with singing can uh, sing for us. <laughs> you are you are very free and welcome to sing as we as we as we leave. No one is king. Sonke, singa ma frega, sonke, singa ma frega, sonke, sonke, singa ma frega, sonke, sonke, singa ma frega, nawe, nawe, afrega, singa ma frega, nawe. Boom, Africa. 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 Now we Africa. Now we Africa. 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 <laughs> Is a little Africa. 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 Sing on Africa. 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 Hey. Thank you very much. Africa. Thank you. Uh...